folks, and welcome or welcome back to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima, I'm again. And this podcast was brought to you, among others, by Emil Gorgis, a Tokyo real estate agent who specializes in serving international or mixed nationality families looking for the perfect family home. So Emil's an Australian. He's been living here in Japan for the past two decades, eight years of which he's been actively buying, selling, and managing real estate properties in the city on behalf of his own family and a great many happy clients. And he also acts as a mortgage broker on behalf of his clients. So his company has a dedicated loan officer in many of the Japanese mega banks. And if you're a regular listener, you probably already know him from our JREP, the Japan Real Estate Experts panel sessions. So you're probably already aware that the man is an absolute fountain of wisdom on all things related to real estate in Japan, and in particular to family homes, the greater Tokyo metropolitan area and mortgages. And most importantly, he's incredibly generous with his time and advice, which he's more than happy to provide at no cost or commitment to anyone asking. So if you've been thinking about buying your home in Tokyo, but you've been sitting on the fence for a while, or if you just want to have a chat in English with a real expert, drop him a line on emil.gorgis, that's E-M-I-L dot G-O-R-G double E S Emil dot Gorgis at Tokyo Realty dot JP. Hit him up today and start exploring your options. All right. So for today's episode, we're back with our J rep Japan real estate experts panel. And this time we've got Matt in attendance as well, which is becoming harder and harder these days as he's getting busier and busier. So we've pounced on the opportunity to talk to him about Akia or vacant slash abandoned homes in the Japanese countryside, which is his specialty. Uh, he's got some stories about monkeys that he shared with us, and we also get more serious and answer some questions from listeners, mainly regarding flipping properties as a business strategy, long and short term rentals out in the countryside. Um, are these all possible? Or are they profitable um, renovation projects and whether it's possible to have them financed? short-term stay regulations and compliance, marketing these countryside properties as businesses and building them up as tourist destinations, and then some more general property market related tidbits such as loan approvals and loan refusals, which can be based on non-standard renovations done to structures, um, raising, reducing, and maintaining rents and the various complexities and legal aspects of these practices, and much, much more. So really nice, long conversation with the usual suspects. Hope you'll enjoy it. And I'll see you again on the other side. Awesome. And we're back. Yay. Hello, everyone. <laughs> In full form today, too. I feel like it's been a while since maybe like two weeks or something. You missed last week. Yeah. We, were, we were on form last week. Well, yeah. For, like, I, I checked out. I loved I last week, actually. It was so <laughs> casual. <laughs> <laughs> it was. I think most weeks are. Um, but I think the week before as well, we cancelled it. Yep. That's right. That's right. right. That's why. Right. That's why it's right. So it's been three away. weeks. Wow. It was a holiday. We're just not aware of them usually until they actually happen. But that's yes. The joys of being a uh, being self-employed. You don't sort of know when when to go to work and when not to go to work. <laughs> so you just, yeah. Am I working? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So um, before before we get into it um, and do the intros and all that, we need to hear about the monkeys, Matt. Yes, we have questions about the monkeys. What about them? <laughs> but what the, the whole story? Run it all by us. Where are you? What happened? Why are there monkeys in the house? Oh, okay. So yeah, this is interesting. Um, it's strange. So Yugawara is like so. There's Odawara, and then after that, there's what is it? Hayakawa, Nebukawa, Manazuru. Yugawara and Atami. And I don't know why, but only Yugawara basically has monkeys. They're, they're, surround, they're very, very, very focused on the Yugawara area. They're not really in Atami. They're not really in, they're kind of in Manazuru a little bit. I, I hear rumor of them in Odawara, but for the most part, they're just like totally focused on Yugawara, which I don't understand. Um, but yes, yeah, so there's a lot of monkeys. In fact, there was a pack yesterday that we were drinking beer and, and watching. Uh, for our evening entertainment. Um, I guess they're drinking beer with. <laughs> almost. <laughs> almost. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of stories about the monkeys, but I think the one that maybe you're referencing is something that I mentioned on Twitter. Yes. 
Okay, so there's the place that I live, which was an Akia, but is is no longer an Akia, obviously. Um, but the one next door is one of the like serious cases of like, okay, that's that's a lost cause. Don't even touch. I mean, there's like a forest growing on the third floor balcony and you know, all this stuff. Um, so last year, the monkeys haven't really been around this year, or maybe I'm just getting impatient, but. I kind of noticed a suspicious lack, a conspicuous lack of monkey business. <laughs> um, but I noticed last year that the the place next to me, the the really hardcore, I, I would call it a haikyo. I wouldn't even call it akia. It's like it's like a just ruined building. Um, I noticed last year that they had busted open the roof and were climbing in and out. And so I'm I'm assuming that like oh okay they they set up shop there um, a bit but then like I think what I was talking about on Twitter was like well apparently if like forty percent of Yugawara is a vacant buildings and so if they did if they if they broke in and and started living in the Akia next to me who's to say that they haven't also done this elsewhere which makes me wonder is there like a hidden underground network. Of, of like monkeys. It's like a whole Walking Dead scenario. There. Yeah. <laughs> They've made yeah. movies about this. We, we should yeah, be concerned. Do they redecorate? That's what I want to know. Do they redecorate? Do they like. You do know, they need they... a sure decorator? So you can maybe, I'm not sure if you call it decoration, but. They fling but... poop on the walls and stuff, right? They like. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Well, and apparently one of the troops of monkeys yesterday got really like rather. Uh, overly confident and so one of my friends has uh you know like the <clears throat> the the little shrine or whatever in your house and that's got the little things of, of sugar and salt and so apparently the other day like mr monkey just decided i, I want that sugar and just went right through the window over to the temp the the shrine thing in their house as they're sitting there <laughs> and just grabbed the sugar and left <laughs> So there's a lot of, there's a lot of the monkey the monk well, this year's monkey report uh is is i believe it's 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 begun <laughs> have started have commenced and the other question i have is like if they take your sandals are they like are they walking around wearing them <laughs> no unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately that i would welcome that as a development no, they just throw them everywhere and then they you know jump up and down on your roof at like 3 a.m like this morning, they were really active, uh, and it's it's very they're a nuisance. You're not, they're, but they're protected by the national government. They're they're some kind of uh, you know symbol or whatnot, and so you can't you can't kill them. You can throw firecrackers at them. The Yugawara Municipal, yeah. I I actually keep meaning to do an interview with the guy who runs the municipally sanctioned. I think it's even like a job. Like there might even be money involved. Um, of there's this troop of I don't know like five like pretty sure all male retirees they've got the official you know you go out a monkey patrol monkey uniform oh wow yeah <laughs> they and, have a and, mask you know, off. and their whole thing is they they run around they, you know they get like a monkey call <laughs> <laughs> right and yeah. like the monkeys are here and they get into their car and they drive over there and they're loaded with a bunch of firecrackers that they just throw at the monkeys and i've seen this i'm not making this up i've seen them at work uh, they're they're literally every day out there protecting the good people of Yugawara from you know monkey maniac. It's not a joke. I saved one of my when we were living in more suburban area of the city. Um, one of my neighbors was not attacked, but like she was just this old little obachan living on her own, and she was like hunkered down inside the house. And this monkey was banging <laughs> on the bars trying to get in. Yeah, we scared him off, but he didn't look too scared. He just like oh, climbed to the top of the hill and just sat there and looked at us. It's not they're like not. you yell at them and they go away. No, no, no. They're totally used to all. Of it. Like you, you just watch. In fact, the, this thing. So I remember watching uh, some of the the order, the, some of the gentlemen <laughs> firecrackers. The order of the monkey. <laughs> yeah, and, and the monkeys are just like hanging out on top of the roof, being like, "Really, guys? Like, I don't think so. Like, you're not scared enough." <laughs> <laughs> we'll just break more things. You need, you need bigger firecrackers. <laughs> yeah. And if you want to experience some of the wonderful adventures of Japan's countryside, this is the perfect segue to introductions. Matt, what do you actually do? Yeah, we. Uh, I'm one half of Akia and Inaka, which is a real estate consultancy. 
uh, that specializes in the location, vetting, and acquisition of all of these wonderful abandoned and otherwise vacant houses across mostly rural Japan. They exist in the cities, but they're usually way worse in the city. And besides, like, why would you want to be in the city when you can have all of this monkey fun? <laughs> so, yeah. Vacant aside from monkeys occasionally. Uh, yeah, I'm like, I like, I like the story of the monkeys stealing <laughs> someone else's stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want any monkeys. Monkeys in my life, I have to deal with. They're a pain. I'm not a fan. I was a fan for like a month or two, and then I just realized that they're just stealing and breaking stuff. <laughs> I can't do anything about it. Yeah, so we're going to go into focus on you um, in a bit, Matt, because I got a really big three-part question for you today. Oh, but um, first, let's introduce the rest of you guys. Tracy? Multiple questions. So yeah, I'm Tracy. I am the short-term rental Mimpaku expert on this panel. So I've been doing short-term rentals in Tokyo for the last decade and um, I do my own and also I help other people set up their rentals and uh, maximize their profits. That's me. And Emil. Hey, my name's Emil. I'm a real estate agent here in Tokyo. I help foreigners um, buy, oh, and you know, lo lo mainly local residents, but usually uh, foreigner, uh, foreign or mixed families, buy their family home in, in Tokyo. Um, and we also have, uh, we also act as a bit of a mortgage broker because we, we're a licensed real estate agency. We have uh, banks um, and loan offices that we liaise with directly. So we also can answer any question and organize your, your typical Japanese home loan financing, you know, 100% financing, you know, 0.5, 0.6% interest rates. So um, yeah, that's what we do. And Zib, over to you, mate. Yep, yeah, and I'm Ziv, and uh, also been at it for about a decade. My wife and I run a real estate advisory and uh, proxy or uh, buyer's advocacy company, and we help uh, foreigners, whether they're in Japan or out of Japan. Uh, most of them are actually out of Japan in most cases, who either are not physically here um, to handle uh, the purchase or management or sale process, or are here but are just for one reason or another not inclined or not able to do it on their own. So we provide them um, full representation on their behalf. Uh, investment properties, holiday homes, land for development, commercial properties, you name it. And we are the uh, Japan Real Estate Experts Panel, or JREP for short. And I'm going to dive right into this really, really big question. Just let me bring it up so that I'm not um, misrepresenting the original poster. Um, so, Matt, this is, I mean, the, the first part of the question is definitely to you, but I think on the, uh, on the other two parts, we can all jump in. Okay. So, um, this guy, is, he's living here in Fukuoka, and what he's asking is, um, why do we never hear of people buying up the old Akia Bank properties and flipping them to foreigners or renting them out to all of the immigrant workers who are coming over? It seems like an obvious market to him, but he's assuming that there might be some regulations preventing these investments, anything of that sort? Um, yeah, it's not that complicated of an answer. I mean, we've touched on a, a big part of it uh, previously, which is that you within five years of purchase you're looking at just ridiculous capital gains taxes and so the whole idea especially of, if you brought it up from zero to actually being worth something right yeah right so the whole idea of flipping in the sense that i think is generally understood um is at best a non-starter right unless you're very masochistic and uh, just want to hemorrhage cash for some reason um there's there's no real good reason to do it within that time frame um, one thing that... But that's individually too, right? Like if you actually purchase it as a company, there's no capital gains tax. Right. And there's... I actually need to check in on that. But generally speaking, we're working with individuals who are looking at uh, getting these things up to speed in that sense. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit of a blank spot. But generally speaking, it's just a very uh, difficult way to go about doing it. But um, what we've... I, mean, it's, I wouldn't even call it a campaign. It's, it's more just like an idea that's still in the works is that, you know, if you just look at it in a different manner with a different time frame, though, and add a few things. And in fact, this is where Tracy would end up coming in. Um, you know, you, you could technically like flip it. It just looks different. Right. And what that would look like, what we envision anyway, is, well, you know, get the place, invest in it, bring it up to working speed get a Minpaku license, rent it out for five or six years or something like that, get past that time frame, And from there, then you can reasonably start 
uh, imagining that you, you can indeed sell the property at a, at a profit, of course. Or even just live in it yourself for like yeah, five years. exactly. Have it, have it pay itself off and things like this. So the uh, it's doable. You just kind of have to re reconfigure what it is, I think. Um, and then there's the whole idea of not hearing of people actually running stuff out. And to that, so far as I can tell, anecdotally speaking, it's, it's similar to the Akia problem in, in general in that, well, it's just not something that normal people do. So most people just don't do this sort of thing. Like the opportunity is there, um, but the kind of the, the precedent, I guess, for it is conspicuously, relatively conspicuously absent. There are, of course, people doing this, and Tracy, I'm sure you can chime in on this as well. Um, but it's it's not like a standard thing to do. And especially through dealing with real estate in Japan, I find that usually people don't like doing non-standard things. And so that's just kind of why uh, you see yes. a lack. Uh, I'll, I'll chime in with that. Yeah, that that people don't like doing standard things. If there's no clear path of least resistance, then you do have to, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, you have a lot of hoops to jump through, and it, and sometimes that sort of takes away, you know, the immediate, um, you know, profit and or fun when you've got to fight bureaucracy. And Minpaku licenses aren't that easy to come by as well. There's a lot of there's a lot of due diligence you've got to do before you can get one um and and i think the other reason is that um there's also a lot of vacancies you know a lot of like normal vacancies it's um you know it's not hard to um you know it's not hard to find places to rent if you're just looking for a normal chintai it's uh, you know normal rental for resident residency it's not hard to find one there's no shortage of houses um uh, but Especially in the um, countryside right is, sorry especially in the countryside especially in the countryside it's, it's you know it's quite easy to find a place but um uh, you know if somebody you know that that's an opportunity i see um it's not to say it can't be done it's just that hasn't really be been done um publicly much so you know mm. maybe if someone goes and does it and then does a netflix series on it then it'll be exactly. it'll be the next thing to do and uh, it'll be the next craze which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, I, so. I dream of the day that that happens. Yeah, so it, it, it would be good. I, I mean, I would do it myself. I just don't have the, you know, I just don't have the, the time and the funds. Um, but, you know, if someone wants to go and do it, I think the market is wide open. So um, there, there are, we're seeing increase, in, in, in fact, this is actually where the Japanese market kind of excels um, with our international market. It's much more about, there's kind of a wellness element to it as well. Um, but also frequently about just changing permanent re or changing uh, their residence or getting a second house, right? The Japanese market um, seems to be very interested in basically what amounts to kind of like Nimpaku with a little bit of teleworking in there, um, but mm -hmm. operating in that universe. Um, so we see it happening. Like it's happening in my backyard down in Yugawara. I know people who are doing this and I see more people buying it up. But um, as with a lot of things in this kind of general territory, it's all rather fragmented and fractured, right? And so there's, I don't think I'd call it, it's, it's not a swell. I'd like to say that, but, you know, it's not yet, it's building, but it's, you know, it's not yet a critical mass. Um, but one thing that I also do, uh worry is maybe not the right word but i i think about anyway is well even if we get a lot of people like even more people doing this if there's no sort of unified narrative or unified narratives about it even if it gets big it'll still remain a kind of underground as it were well i mean each but you know but you know there's no there's no set formula in any in any city office right so right, you right. know each and that's the same with minpaku like the way um the way that licensing is handled um is on a city by city by region mm -hmm. by region basis yeah. and that's the same with i guess with yakia it's like yep. you know there's no set formula you've really got to you know you've really got to each one is a new learning curve there's nothing that you can sort of do and then rinse and repeat rinse and repeat rinse and repeat and that's when you know when you 
have a business model like that, that's when it's sort of more interesting to a developer. Well, um, until someone starts, right? I mean, once like, until like someone Matt starts said, and yeah. docu- and like and blogs about it and documents it, you know, someone who's who's not needing to make a quick turnaround, who's able to do it, um, that's, and then yeah. lead the way. Yeah. Matt, um, in your um, Akia Hunter video series, um, are you just? Um, I've watched a few, but I've seen you looking at them and, and, you know, inspecting them for purchase and so forth. You haven't actually done one where you're actually renovating a place like a before after kind of thing. Not Not yet, yet. right? No. Is that in the works? That's something that we're looking into. Honestly, we're we're a two-person team. We got a lot of stuff that we need to do. Editing videos, unfortunately, is not at the top of it. So I, I have all sorts of content that I'm intending to get out. But So you have done these projects, you just haven't made a video of it yet? Uh, there's one that kind of walks you through it, but no, we need, like, so far as actual, like, okay, this is the project and we're following it and all of that, we haven't done that yet. We do intend to get that out there. And I think, I mean, really, if you look at what's, is it NH, it's one of the major channels, like a lot of the most popular TV shows in Japan right now, what's the Potsun to Kenya, is that the one? Uh, there's there's a lot of ho- interest in home renovation, especially rural home renovation right now. So it it to to me, I mean, it's not even a hunch. Like I can say, pretty like it's it's odd that there seems to be probably something close to what you might call critical mass with regards to just interest in rural stuff. But there's there's it's that last mile thing. There's still something that's kind of getting in the way. Um, of really kind of turning the engine on and, and getting things rolling. Uh, I do think that the content, and that is something too that we very much aim to do with our business. Of course, you know, yeah, we help sell properties, but really kind of the, the crux of it though is to make cases and show precedents for not just daydreaming about living, you know, a more rural life, but actually saying, hey, look, here's a crazy look, guy. It can be done. Not, yeah. It can be done. Well, you know what? Why? So my, I, I come from a perspective where there's just not enough money in it for the time and effort required, which is why the m- people aren't picking it up, why we're not hearing about it, why it's not becoming a thing. Especially when you consider the time and effort required, there's the opportunity of that time and effort to be invested in, well, you have places like Tokyo, bigger cities. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Right? Mm-hmm. And so just off the bat, right? Like, And I, I want to ask, I guess, about actual numbers, right? That we're talking about. So what is the expected profitability, even if you get something for zero, right? Even if we start off with zero. So the best case scenario is you got a property for free, mm-hmm. right? What are we looking at? Like to get it to the, the, the cost involved or to get it to a, a sellable a, condition. No, no, sellable or even just rentable. If you're renting for, re- and, and, and let's not talk about minpaku, right? There's this thing, someone wants to the free, either, the chinchan, either, yeah. re- resell all regular Japanese rental. That's saying, actually hey, why you just part of his, um, and the, rent them. The, the second part of his question is actually uh, about that. He's asking, um, in terms of this repair of these properties, what are the typical jobs involved? Is it a quick paint job here and there or mm-hmm. some gutters or, you know, deeper mm-hmm. issues like framing and rot and mold and like, are we talking 10,000, 100,000? I, I suppose there's not really a benchmark for that, right? It all oh, depends but, on what you're looking for, yeah. right? But, I mean, if, if you want to spend an additional 200,000 US on renovating, we can totally find you one of those. I don't know why you'd want to do it, um, but that's possible. There are also other ones that require, you know, maybe on the order of 100,000 yen or hundreds of thousands of yen, not dollars. So we're talking... Yeah. So, you know. yeah, so uh, like my, my thing is, okay, so let's, because we this, this comes up a lot, right? Why, what about this flip? And I've, I've explained in, in the past, like why flipping doesn't even make sense for Tokyo properties. Mm. No, not, it doesn't make sense. In the, it doesn't make sense for individuals. They're, like there are companies that do it professionally. Mm. They have access to the finance, that's their business. And you look at their database, they're not, they don't have one or two a month. They, they'll have like 20 or 30 available listings at any one time yeah. mm-hmm. that they've got that they that they are flipping right so it's a, a big business so the idea of flipping works but we talked about it and i, I guess i'll repeat some of the, the numbers and stuff that as we go through so we mentioned capital gains tax so for people listening if you make a uh, sell uh, real estate for a profit um and you've held, held it for less than five years it's 40 percent of the profit is capital gains tax is taxable right well, you have to hold it for over five years for it to be 
the lower rate of 20% capital gains tax. I think that those are the right numbers, correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's 40% for the first, if you sell within the first five years, 20% if you sell it after that. Okay. So that, that, that's one reason why it doesn't work um, for an individual. Again, if your business is a real estate um, renovation company, then you don't pay that capital gains um, tax. Rather, and you probably got the contacts in place to actually make it profitable, yeah. right? Yeah, right. And, yeah. And so they're, they're, yeah, sort of place. they're mostly apartments, though, as well. They're buying up sort of the the condo style, like you know, mansions. I've seen houses. No, 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 no houses. Think, yeah, we bought ours yeah. from one of a from a company oh, okay. that did exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, they, they do houses as well. Um, and what happens is those ones never even come to the market. Okay, they're, like there's someone whoever wants to sell is like, you know, we want to sell it quickly without any, any of the typical like three month wait period or they don't have the capacity to do that. Um, and the agent will say, look, if you, if you want to sell it, like, let's say it's worth 50 million, look, if you're going to want to all right, selling it for 40 million yen or 42 million yen, like at an almost 20% discount also, then yeah, okay, I, I have a company, a renovation company, they'll buy it cheaply and they'll, they'll fix it up. And sometimes it can be very minor, just new wallpaper. And maybe you know some like just some uh, and and cleaning right new stove top and that's it. So they haven't actually changed the bathroom, toilets, or kitchen. They just cleaned it up and, and wallpaper is like the bare minimum. Um, and but that's still considered a renovation flip, right? Uh, so um, and this they'll say, yeah, I got this company. They'll come and they'll come. Yeah, great, cool. Let's sign the contract. We get it done. Um, we've got the financing approved because they've already got lines of credit. They don't need to do the typical application and and stuff that, that we do. Um, that individuals need to do um, and they're able to access it really cheap because they know um, it never goes to market and it's very very convenient for the seller whereas as an individual you don't have that ability to buy it at that cheaper price and and just talking about the scale of numbers right you can get if you buy cheap enough it's okay to get five to ten million yen off a property in tokyo right uh, there's 50 million yen or an old apartment Right, or let alone even if it's a you know a more expensive one, even fifteen million yen off. So just just by purchasing wisely, you save fifteen million yen, right? That you can sort of make on top in terms of the flip. Whereas, what numbers are we looking at for these like uh, these um, the akia, right? The whole project, including purchase, full renovation, etc., might be ten million yen, mm. right? And if you do flip, like how much? What's the expected? You know, whoever's slipping, what are they expecting to make? They're going to buy it for or get it, let's say, for nothing, right? Spend five to eight million yen on renovating it. Like, I mean, if it's if they bought it for nothing, it might cost almost a hundred grand. And then you to, sell it to bring for it up like, to like, 12, 12, maybe if so, you're lucky, right? What are they making? Like, five, lucky, yeah. five million, like maybe what? They're talking a good case is maybe making five million yen. I, I've got no idea, but there's like, if you can make five million yen on a flip, do you think that's that like mm -hmm. for a, an Akia type property? Does that seem like it's way undervalued? Like, is that a very low estimate, or is that a realistic or high estimate? In a, in on a how much time scenario. you spent on it, too, right? How much yeah. time and effort it took you? It's it's extremely uh, what variable. Uh, yeah. It wouldn't really make any sense. I, I'm sure you could probably pull if it was a, in the right place and the right build and not very dilapidated and this that. And if all the pieces came together. Yeah, maybe, but uh, just because the entire landscape is just so out of whack and, and poorly admitted, like it's very, very difficult to even make estimates like that, which is why one of the major reasons why we don't really dabble in investment properties. We, we are, or at least try to be pretty, um, what, open. Lifestyle oriented. Right? Exactly, yeah. right? Because um, the fact is, this is kind of no man's land that we're dealing with right now. If, and if sort of like Tracy was saying, you know, if somebody who had patience and the funds and was willing to rake, take the risk and go in there and do it a few times and just make that case, that would serve, that would be very, very, very positive in that it would finally kind of, well, hopefully anyway, break down sort of the, the stigmas that are associated with both Akia as well as Inaka. But the fact is right now that hasn't happened yet. Right. And so really we need to incur before we can even honestly start talking about sort of returns and ROI and whatnot, the environment right now doesn't isn't even tooled like for that use case. And so the first thing that we're really trying to do right now is merely affect 
people kind of appeal to the emotional side of things and be like, well, yeah, okay, you're probably not going to make a profit on it, but you got a great vacation house. You're in the forest. There's the wellness thing. You got the trees and the monkeys and whatnot. Um, that's really kind of our appeal at the moment. So far so, as the so his the idea of um, of leasing them out to uh, foreign farm workers in those areas. I mean, like Tracy was saying, it's very easy to find places to rent that are not. Yeah, a there's, there's not a lot of dem- like you know, there's it's not as if there's a, a massive housing shortage, um, mm-hmm. and there's no inbound workers right now. So uh, yeah, there's there's not a massive shortage. I mean, if that changes, obviously, then there'll be more incentive to to do that because that you could get more um you know more more roi um but a lot of the the akia is is the the purchase and renovation it is more labors of love it's for lifestyle yeah. and also and also like i rescued a house from from destruction and there's there's a there's a beauty to that so yeah. um so but it, it, if it's pure hard numbers if it's pure investment there's there's not masses amount of meat in there and there's not a blueprint to follow yet as well. Okay, so for the last, yeah, for the last part of his question, and I guess, um, I guess I know the answer to this one, but I'll just check in any case. Um, are there any um, legal requirements for a house to be at minimum levels of, you know, either innovation or safety before you can? Um, well, he's asking about selling or renting it out. I know for a fact, and Matt can probably testify that there's no requirement for a sale. Like people mm-hmm. buy basically two two blocks of cardboard and a bit of wood and call it a house but how about for renting it to a tenant for, for min pucko i can answer that for min pucko you need you need to to get your license you actually have to have a safety certificate which means that a certified company has to come in and you know you have to jump through all of their hoops and and make sure you it's mostly fire regulations that you've got to check yeah. but um you won't be able to rent it out for short-term rental if you don't have this safety certificate but just just that that's regular fire fire stuff so that can be there's basically fire alarm systems right um for the most there's part a bit like more light, than that, lighting though, isn't there? Uh, the lighting but it's not really structural they're not checking the structural integrity of the property yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. right so you can get like basically an electrician to come in electrical company to come in and they need to put the necessary emergency lighting in place and fire alarms in place so it's but, not a fire and, hazard yeah. So, oh, so if no, if there is a fire, people can um, exit. Like p- people, the, the exit signs are labeled and and what have you, right? So, but that's not as that's say fire safety checks. Um, it's not something. It's not a structural renovation. So even if the pillars are rotting, you can still get the. That's not going to be covered by the, the fire mm. check, right? Whereas if you want to rent it out for regular Japanese rental, and I think this this is one thing I wanted to mention before. When you're doing a regular chintai, um, Japanese-style rental, you're going to have difficulty renting it out if it's not really up to scratch. Yeah. Okay, especially when you're comparing it to like place like mansions that are just designed straight up for rental, and it, it's a concrete building without any of the structural issues. Maintenance is sort of kept up. Um, whereas, like if you have an issue with with your your akia, right? If the windows are, if water is leaking. Mm-hmm. right um if the, the windows aren't opening and closing properly mm-hmm. you need to like the tenant can complain say like these things need to be functioning if the doors not locked, they don't just put up with it if the bathtub they have one of those old whatever bathtub like that and if that's leaking you have to repair it they're yeah. not like oh it's old so they like the charm of it being <laughs> being a mess no, for rental, it's, it's very, very tough. It's going to meet the standards of a typical rental. But so I suppose that somebody who would be renting an Akia is not exactly the same tenant profile that you would be mm-hmm. renting a mansion in the city, right? Yeah, so it's not as... Yeah, so the problem is that means the market is a lot lower. It's a lot less. It's not... So it doesn't... It's not a comparable, oh, let's, let's just rent it out. Let's get this... Op- let's see if this property for almost nothing and make it a rental. And now I've got a whole portfolio of these great rental properties that cost me nothing who's going to rent that, them? <laughs> yeah yeah exactly who's going to rent them they're not great rental portfolio um it's not a great rental portfolio whereas if you just had you know a portfolio of 10 different apartments in, in mansions even one room mansions you're laughing yeah. right assuming that they're just an ordinary mansion that we're familiar with in a concrete building you pay the management fee and stuff and that's it um that's that's really easy 
But that's um, it. So there I is think... a lot of vacancy as well. Like, you know, there is no, there is, if you're looking for an apartment to rent, to live in, um, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of vacancies. Um, and uh, so, you know, there's, there's not masses of demand that's pushing the prices up. If anything, they're, you know, they've been really flat for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, we've uh, we haven't been anyway. able to raise the rent so on long-term leases, which is most of what we do. With it's very rare that we can raise the rent between tenants. In most cases, it's either um, the same, and often it's actually less. So yeah. Mm. When there's a new development being built in the area, but again, again, this is nothing to do with Inaka. But if there's a new um, building that was just recently constructed, it kind of goes in waves. Like if an area becomes popular then there's going to be construction going up. And once construction goes up, then, you know, all of these new beautiful apartments are available for rent at prices that are, you know, they're definitely higher, but they're not like double the price of the old ones. So then that creates huge pressure on older building owners. And it's kind of a race to the bottom with the rents. Like you have to keep reducing it, reducing it, reducing it. The alternative to that is to offer all sorts of incentives. If you don't want to join the race, you offer incentives that might attract tenants like, uh, you know, first month or two free rent or, you know, the owner will pay the move-in fees or in some cases, depending on location, maybe furnished or semi-furnished and that kind of thing. And then you might be able to hold the rent, but you're definitely not going to be raising it. Yeah, we're raising rent, um, like in, in typical in Tokyo, is a very, very uncommon and hard thing to do. And it's also kind of equivalent to asking the, uh, we had a situation recently, saying, can we do it? And our rental team was saying basically if you want to increase the rent um the tenant can say no and if you want to then you go to the you know basically to the court and you can say look the reason we're, we're increasing this is because market prices look at the assessed land tax market prices have gone up 20 yeah. percent okay so it makes sense that it, it goes up and the tenant can will likely say well if you're going to raise it then i'm going to leave which we interrupt this broadcast, I always wanted to say this, we interrupt this broadcast to tell you about Tokyo Family Stays. They're a short-term rentals company in Tokyo and they offer a home away from home experience, which is just perfect for remote working, quarantining, or if you just need summer quiet to hide away from the world. So they offer a variety of options for families, for corporate relocations, or simply if you're transitioning between homes in Tokyo. Now the properties are super comfortable, tastefully furnished, fully equipped with all amenities, and they accommodate up to 10 people. So really the only thing you'll need to bring with you is your toothbrush and maybe a change of clothes. They've got fast, unlimited wireless internet, dedicated workspaces, and fully equipped kitchens, and they're just a delight to stay in, a fantastic alternative to Japanese business hotels, which if you've ever stayed in one, you probably know they're tiny, they're noisy, fine for a night or two if you're on your own, but long-term or with a family, you'll probably feel you're in a jail cell very quickly. So if you want to give yourself a sense of space and freedom by renting a real home with comfortable Western beds, including all the necessities like baby bedding, children's toys, high chairs, you definitely want to reach out to Tokyo Family Stays. They've been at it for over a decade. They're a fully licensed minpaku or short-term stay operator. And as a special bonus for our viewers and listeners, they're also throwing in a breakfast basket upon arrival for anyone who books and mentions the Japan Real Estate Podcast or NTI. And not only for guests, if you're a property owner, you've got an investment property that you want to tweak for higher profits or a holiday home that you want rented out when not in use via short-term stays, drop them a line today, see how they can help you maximize your property's income. And again, as a special bonus to our viewers and listeners, they're also offering a free audit of your existing short-term stay listings without any obligation whatsoever. So feel free to reach out to them at tokyofamilystays.com. Well worth your visit. And again, if you're in the market for a family home in or around the Tokyo metropolitan area, Emil's your man. Don't be shy to reach out to him as well at emil.gorgies, G-O-R-G-E-E-S at tokyorealty.jp. Which is and, what happened to us. They didn't even get to court. As soon as we told them we're raising right. the rent, they didn't even say no. They just left. Yeah, yeah. like exactly. So there's one thing. Then you've got to be sure that you're going to be getting that out. rent from the next one, right? Because yeah. otherwise yeah. you're stuck. Yeah. But if there's no if there's no increase, like if you get the land tax assessment and there's, you know, I'm not seeing like a 20% increase in the government's land tax assessment, you're going to be hard pressed to legally sort of increase the rent. 
We don't even go by that. I mean, we have had properties that have increased in value. That has been a thing in some areas. It's happened in Tokyo. It's happened in Fukuoka and a lot of cities that we deal with. Um, but rents haven't gone up. I mean, and, and that's not going to happen unless salaries go up. And salaries haven't gone up for a long, long while. If people can't afford to, and, you know, there are other comparable properties in the vicinity for a similar rent, then why, you know, they will just move out and move into one of those, right? And they don't like to move, yeah. they don't have to, and they'll never approach you to ask you to reduce the rent if it's gone down. Like we've got tenants in place that have been paying, you know, pre-bubble rent, which is almost double to what it is these days. They'll never ask us for a discount, but, you know, on the same, on the same token, we, we can't raise the rent on that. Yeah. Mm. Okay, well, that's it for um, what I thought was a big and juicy question. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, and no, my, my take on the flipping side is if you start a business flipping, like, you know, when I say smaller value, smaller value properties, you go to the effort of finding them. Renovation work is actually a lot more complex, I think, would be for, old, for an older Akia type house mm. um, than an old mansion. It's like than a, a, a Tokyo based apartment or mansion. They say you start doing an Akia and you've done four or five of them and you're making a few million yen of each property. You're like, hold on. Then you see an opportunity in Tokyo for a, a place that's, instead of being a, a four-bedroom house, a huge house that's worth 10 million yen, it's one, it's a 15 square meter one-room apartment for the same price. It's like, hey, I can get this re-wallpapered and ready to flip in about a week. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, no structural work. Deal. Yeah, it's like, like hold on. You, I, I just, I just feel like you know, it's and it's it's faster to do. The turnover is faster. So, and the more turnover means the more property that you can do. And because it's more standard, it's easier to uh, to guess the market price. What's a, what you're going to be able to resell it for or rent it for? So you know if it's a, worth doing the purchase on it. And it's very easy to understand structurally. There are not going to be any surprises that the beans are running. Usually it's going to be a, a, a concrete apartment and you see all the renovation history, right? So you're not responsible for a lot of the other, the, 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 the structural side of stuff, or you, you have some guarantee that it's okay. Um, I, I just see like, if you are successful in doing the, the Akia type flips and renovations, you're just going to like, it just seems like easier. I don't know. Like, I mean, it's coming, if you're coming from the purely financial profit-based aspect, Oh, yep. but, which I think that question almost is, right? If it's a labor of love and, and you want to... Yeah, that's you know, what I was going to say. It's kind of like the guest house story, right? Like if, if that's your thing and you're the DIY type and it's a labor of love and you're really loving to, to you know, bring these, um, you know, older, gorgeous homes back to their glory and then sell it at some sort of profit, then yeah. But if you're looking to make a profit, there are easier ways to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, financing is also going to be a lot easier. Um, financing yeah, we have is non-existent for Akia, right? Uh, basically, if you're under 10 mil, nobody's going to talk to you. If you're over 10 mil, somebody might, but it's still... They got to think it's worth 10 mil, right? Yeah, it's it's doable, but it's not all that common. Usually, there's you can either do that or get renovation um, loans, but mostly our clientele is just basically paying all through cash. Yeah. And, and I think the cash buys for that, it means it's hard to scale. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have... 15 million yen for each project. Well, let, let's say 10 million yen a project, $100,000 mm -hmm. per project. We just even put that, right? Because it's going to be between like eight and 12, right. right? Or five and 15, right? So 10 million a project, like how many are you going to be doing, right? Um, that but that ties into what cash. you were explaining, Emil, about how loans work here. It's not actually drawing on the equity. There's a, there's always going to be a limit based on whatever you're making, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And especially, and if it's only, if I think Akiya is going to be, it's 100% cash. Mm -hmm. Whereas it, it, you're going to have, I think, just access to, you're going to be able to access things more, access funds more, um, if you're doing it with um, apartments that you can get financing for, even if it's an investment loan, right? The, the model is, is pretty straightforward. Okay, you buy it, this is how much they're worth, um, and you're, like, this is how much rent you can expect, this is how much renovations cost, etc. That's something easier to present to a bank. However, the... Oh, sorry, Tracy, you want to... I was going to say, it's the other thing that's, that, that you know, we're, we're talking just pure real estate, whereas what, you know, where I see big opportunities is where someone is doing a hybrid with an existing 
sort of peripheral business. So, for example, yeah. I know some people who are, um, you know, using finance to uh to renovate and actually build a crossfit gym in the middle of nowhere yeah, yeah. and actually building a business or an infrastructure and, a, and a, an ecosystem that's not just based on the bricks and the mortar well, the, right. the, the, the the timber the and the, mortar, the plaster but, <laughs> yeah but the but built around an, an another type of business whether it be like i said a crossfit gym or some sort of experience or a yoga retreat matt working on it <laughs> working on it i've already got the te- i've already got the yogi <laughs> wellness spa you know with that when you actually build as a destination um mm. a different business and then you use akia like you know use the renovation of of the the, the mm. areas around you that's a, certainly a really good way of of, of uh reducing costs and so that's, that's that. a very really good point that you make tracy is that kind of the thing that really kind of triggered my interest in all of this as many things it goes back to music but it's very similar to crossfit or whatever in that Akia by themselves are probably a pretty lackluster and uninteresting <laughs> um, thing. However, the application, um, as, tra- right. as Tracy very astutely pointed out, if you consider them in, in relation to each other and an ecosystem, what they really represent or can represent is nascent infrastructure. Right. And with that, then you can start building communities or destinations or experiences or this, that and the other thing. And so they're really not intended to even really be investment properties, even in the best of times. And that that's not the purpose that they're serving. The purpose that they're serving is facilitating people doing people stuff. Right. And presumably, you know, paying for a weekend yoga retreat, which you can charge up to about 800 bucks a pop for if you want. Exactly. Yes. Right. And make, or the make the cash retreat. on that. Or wellness retreats out in um, Yamanashi that we're working on. There's some stuff out in Chiba as well. There's a whole bunch of surf culture down in the Izu Peninsula, as well as diving. And in fact, Manazuru, the spot that's one stop up north of where I live in Yugawara, is an incredibly popular and very robust Akia ecosystem. And people are in investing there right for dive retreats and snorkel retreat and fishing and stuff like this and so from a strictly financial tool point of view i gave her a terrible fucking idea <laughs> <laughs> and this goes back to what we were talking about last week tracy with them if there is a community and an infrastructure similar to the airbnb and mintaku discussion right if there is a community of um, uh, not landlords, but owners who are getting into this and marketing their area and communicating with each other and sharing their resources to make it an experience, to to put the place on the map, so to speak, then there's a lot that you can do. But as long as everybody stays in their bubble and this is just like my dream home, maybe yes, maybe no, it's not going to happen, is it? No, and and, and I really think that, you know, it's it's more than just like house it's just more than house by house by house it's like if you look at it as a project basis there's a lot to be done um but you know some of these small country towns are just not that pretty um to like they're just not but that can be you solved put, though you can that can be it, solved yeah. if you make if you think out of the box and like think well what what can i do to make this a destination of its own so whether it be the yoga or the crossfit or the whatever it is goats. that you that you do sorry the goats, the goats. Yes. The goats, the goats. The goats. <laughs> or you know um you know there's there's all sorts of stuff you could do like you know there's eco eco tourism there's adventure tourism there's like all sorts of stuff so um, interestingly weddings uh, pop-up yeah. weddings or a you wedding know, village that almost sounds like oh. nightmare before christmas kind of stuff no um, <laughs> <laughs> in, in, interestingly, I was just up in um, Ishikawa. I think I mentioned that previously. Um, and there's a city there called Wajima. It's on the north, what, the north coast facing the Sea of Japan. I just sent a link over. Um, there's a spot called, I don't even know what to call it, right? Because it has a name. It's called Kabulet, Kabule. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, but what it is, I think it's a government initiative that bought up a whole bunch of Akia, got some pretty decent architects from Kanazawa, which is a well-known kind of historical landmark city, also in Ishikawa prefecture, and renovated them and turned them into Akia cafes and Akia ramen shops and Akia libraries and kind of all of this stuff, right? And it was also extremely interesting that um, a lot of the employees, one of the reasons that they that they did this, I guess, was um, to facilitate, uh, I 
I want to say prefectural people in Ishikawa prefecture who might have, you know, a mental or a physical disability that makes it difficult for them to work. And so a lot of the employees, like salaried employees at these places that were produced using Akia um, ended up supporting these communities as well. It's very rural. It's very hard to get to. I'm, I, I was actually very, very surprised that this existed. But when I was in Ishikawa, I mentioned to the Ryokan owner, like, oh, no, Akia and stuff. They were like, dude, you got to go check out Wajima. It's an amazing thing that they've yeah, done. That's exactly it, though. Like, they, they created a destination. That's, the, that's what we keep telling people who are looking into these old... Um, resorts and some of them are in really good shape and some of them are huge and some of them are really cheap like you know 20 30 room oh. former onsen hotel resort that, that you can buy for like less than half a mil it's yes. a really good deal but you're not just it's not going to be enough to create the perfect resort you're not going to have to create the whole destination to get exactly. people to come there exactly you've literally got to like build a world <laughs> I'm, I'm also thinking if if it's a location where there are so many akia that just it's like it's maybe not a very attractive location. That's why it was able to get so many akia there. But well, that could be just um, because it hasn't been it hasn't been attractive in the sense that you know nobody's actually set up shop there to make it attractive. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong but, with it. But when but when that's certainly the case. With, but but when it's artificial, like when the government tries to artificially just create, like you know they build it and they will come. Um, I think the places that become you know gentrified ah it's a, there's a natural kind like an evolutionary process to it it's not it doesn't matter how much money you throw at it yes superficially if if the infrastructure isn't there if there isn't something a bit more compelling to be there mm -hmm. um you know and you look at like some snow resorts where well, like they have this, this, the fact that there's snow right there's a certain thing about it right um you, you can't just make something out of nothing right well, like, I mean, what like about, to a degree yes what about Japan, how ugly can it be yeah it can, i mean it can get pretty ugly <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i mean that 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 we talked about this a couple of weeks ago is that that um that artist island um and uh you know that old that that sprung up and and uh but that was a decision by the by the town to to make um to make it make it an artist retreat um, yeah, but but how many but one, how will, many of them are going to be so successful? Yeah, like, how many I, of those I will are actually say successful? That very, very often, the municipal government is the municipality's worst enemy. Um, yeah, they tend to just be terrible at everything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, very. That, that is, it's not a joke. That's really the case, though. Unfortunately, so, but that's also why. Um, I mean, another part we we're still kind of spinning it up, but what we dubbed the Inaka Club right is just getting people out there for kind of unique i like the word visceral but like unique kind of intimate not in like the sexual sense but you know just like people getting together and like having an experience together um and just being able to open and kind of guide people hold their hands into having honestly probably not even that like spectacular of an experience merely an experience in a place that they never thought that they could have that before right um, that's very important. And if you don't do that, right, as Emil was pointing out, you can't make something out of nothing. But that's the first step, though. People have to fall in love with something, right? Exactly. Yeah, well, so really, there's a whole lot of serendipity involved in because not all the places are great. Like, I'll be the first person to tell you that. There's a lot of places that I think are just like, please, I wish you'd be wiped off the map. <laughs> like, how, like uh, that area where, where you said they, they made like Chinaki is in this, and they got like, you know, a lot of the disabled community to, to you know, get employed there. Mm. How hot are the cafes? You want to go and get a coffee, right? And like, how, like, how awesome are these coffee shops or these Pretty restaurants nice. that they got there? They're not spectacular, like, like, though, like, right? Like, can you can you find a better one down in Shimokitazawa? Right, oh, like, or, or play, like, or even just just any location. One that's like, or by the one where it really has an individual who's like, I want to start a coffee shop, and I'm going to go and set up. Like, this is a nice area. It's, it's a bit of a spot. I'm going to go and make a cafe there, like, you know, or the artsy type of gallery, a gallery slash cafe thing. Someone who's actually gone there with that intent versus, and the quality of that cafe, and then you go there and you can, you know, have a good experience. When one hot cafe sort of opens up in a good spot, mm -hmm. that leads to maybe more sort of artists or more sort of people coming through. And, oh, and it's, it's the art culture. The that thing is, it. it's, it's kind of a, again, it's, it's sort of a labor of love. It's sort of saying, hey, I recognize this place actually isn't all that great, but <laughs> like 
Let's go do it. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, but yeah, but it's gonna have something for it, right? You have, whereas that's why if it's just the, the, the municipalities, like, oh, you know what? Let's just let's just see if it sticks. Well, that, that could either be the spot, though, or it could be the community itself. If the community is unique enough and brings something to the table that's, you know, that's difficult to find in other places, then, you know, the natural settings might matter a little bit less. I, I was blown away by the accessibility of this Wajima place, which is something that I'm, I'm quite keen about. Uh, long story, but yeah. I've, I've, so, so, is it, so it's very accessible, you mean? Extremely it's accessible. Easily accessible. Right. But that puts it that puts it on the map for for you know people um, who are looking for very accessible places. I mean, and there's a whole marketing around you know traveling traveling in Japan, like um, weekend getaway kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, and and serving a particular niche. Um, yeah. And I, what I was going to jump in with was that you know if you do have an idea of um, of building a business, there, there's a bunch of like rural revitalization grant money that you can get yes it's a real pain to fill out all the forms but there's money there um and then you can match the um so the the meti the meti grants that you can get i can actually send you the link for the meti grants um if you want to put them in the show notes if yeah um and you know that's free money you have to put the money in first and then they will reimburse you um up to 50 percent of what you've um of what you've invested yeah, it's um, happening here in saga now i know um yeah. quite a few people who've been getting into it and then you can and then you can play the, the local banks there's there's <laughs> there's money that's been allocated to these various places and if you can put a good enough case study forward and you know you've got to do, you know fill out the forms and you've got to have your business plan like you should as a proper business anyway but if you can you know go through that red tape there's money to be had um so uh but there yeah, is I, I, um, th there is the i mean you still need to know you still need to know how to make a business and how to make it profitable. I mean, Absolutely. Like, you still that, have that to have a project, viable idea. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's been tested or not, doesn't, yeah. you know, that this is a way that you can test it using government money rather than your own. But, mm -hmm. um, but it's but, not, uh, like you said, it's 50%, right? So like here in oh, Saga, that's my friend... Like, that's sorry? But that's significant though, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, no, I it is significant. But I mean, fifty percent of a million bucks is still half a million bucks. If you're going to make it, a, you know, you're going to put in half a million bucks and nobody comes, you're still going to be out of pocket, right? Yeah. No, but but I know someone who's done that, and actually, what she's done is leveraged then the 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 the, the local banks to um, to fund the money up front as a bank loan. So so the the grant money comes after she spent the money, but that so because she's got. The grant money secured she's able then to leverage that and get a bank loan to cover the upfront costs so that she's not up for it personally and then um, and then a lot of the bank loan is then paid off by the grant money that comes in after she spent the money so if you're creative with you know if you're creative with your finance or you work with a business partner who's creative with that there there are ways to do this and um, but yet yeah, you've got to have a really you know solid idea first my my, so. my next thing is how do you do this with young kids? So, and by that I mean, if you if you like, if it's a lifestyle, a meal, children, and it's not yeah, ours. It's a, it's exactly, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's a lifestyle. It's just I think all the time people that have almost the, the like you, you you have to be so individually involved, um, yeah. and and basically relocate because you're not traveling there just every morning, right? You're going to need to to relocate. I think for a big part of it, so. If you have a family or if you have other regular employment, like this is, you, you can't do this as just a side hustle. Um, this, this uh, you sort of probably hey. could. It depends, on, it depends on where you are, right? Like, and how old the kids are. <laughs> and how old the kids are. I would, exp yeah, the, the family things hey. are complicated. Hey. Speaking, speaking of kids, hey, Tracy. Um, hello, hello. hello. this is a, oh, so, uh, look, I can run a, like, I, I run a business with, with a kid, you know. Hello. Um, hello. <laughs> <laughs> this camera is funny. It's funny, yeah. It's following it's it. Mm. There we go. So, uh, so anyway, I didn't want to interrupt your your thought process, Emil, um, of being able to work with with kids. I mean, it's it, it's hard. It's a it's a juggle, and um, uh, but it's more the location, right? We're talking rural, like you basically. Oh, right. Whether you like, if you like the country or not, your your kids are, are going to be at local schools. 
And then you have to go to, unless you're doing the revitalization project locally and you don't have to really move, then that's okay. But when you go to another prefecture, you gone. I think that's where the issues are around. Like, you yeah, know, there's people like that have their own businesses. Like, you know, Trace, for example, like we, you, you can have kids and have your own business. But the business that we're talking about now about revitalizing areas and finding up have good deals and we're growing them up and making them cool and funky. Mm-hmm. That, that's that's not two kilometers down the road. No, um, no, no. The, uh, yeah, the no, spot, no. that comes up every once in a while on the Fujino area of Kanagawa um, is kind of our go to sort of recommendation. The educational facilities there are what is it? The Steiner School. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, it's a straight shot on the Chuo line. So, like, it's accessible. It's probably it's about an hour, I think, uh, west-ish, northwest of, let's say, Shinjuku. Um, we know some people there fixing up Akia and stuff. But, I mean, you're correct, right? This is also not something that is for everybody. Like, it's, it's all a very circumstantial um, kind of thing. And, you Again, know, labor of love. It's not an investment strategy. It's a project. Mm-hmm. We were talking about financing uh, a second ago, right? And the difficulty will be for financing a property in like Akia, right? It's basically, it's all cash job. Um, I want to touch on that. We have a client right now who's looking uh, just by Tamagawa River. Mm-hmm. He's looking at buying a property. And what's happened is it's a two-story property. and But it has a large, like, uh, like the, the second floor has like a large, um, quite a high ceiling. And, they, and so what you have is a loft. Okay, um, it, it's pretty common. And by regulation, a loft is like sort of an attic space. Okay, yeah. But it, it can't be more than 1.4 meters high, though. So they have to cap the ceiling, right? So um, I've, I've got one sort of in, in my place as well. I've got two, two lofts. And you go in, and even though it looks like the roof line can go higher, there is a ceiling at 1.4 meters. And so often, like, you know, so if the roof is like this, there'll be a, a ceiling line at 1.4 meters. And then there's the, the slope on the on the sides, right, right? right? So, and even if you think, wow, they can just open this up and make it really quite high, by regulation, if it's over 1.4 meters, it will it'll be counted as a room and counted as space, mm. okay? So let's say you the, the property can be a maximum of 100 square meters and you have a loft area. The loft area, if the ceiling is 1.4 meters high, it's it's, even if it's like, 10 square meters or 15 square meters, it won't add to the 100 square meters of the building. Right, right. Right? The regulation says this building can't be more than 100 square meters. The loft space area doesn't count. This it. is right? relevant it's for what? For property tax calculations? Uh, no, but just for, for building regulations. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But um, once, well, with the situation we had is once it was built, the cell, it's a nine jaw, 10, ten jaw loft which is quite a large size. Massive, yeah. Yeah, yeah once they've, and it's, just, it's above the living room, um, and it had like just the old ladder. Once, once they bought it, got the financing, they built in like a fixed staircase and they removed that, that ceiling and put it all like the, the flat 1.4 meter high ceiling and put it all the way to the roof, which is about two meters high, two, mm. not more, like 2.2 meters. And it, it slants down, but it's pretty much, but you can use it as a, even a bedroom. Like it's not like even the slant is not low. It's massively high. Um, so they have like this oven, now it's like a 10 jaw extra size third floor. Um, and we went to the bank for looking for bank loan and the banks won't touch it. Mm-hmm. Banks will not touch it. They, they say, um, and there's also a balcony that like, they, they built like uh, where the driveway is. They extended the balcony out. Um, so now the balcony is like about two and a half or three meters deep and by four meters wide. It's a nice, beautiful balcony. And it's by the water on mm-hmm. Tamagawa River. So basically, straight up the balcony, like it's just the river right in front of you. It won't touch it because it's, what? Because you conceivably built over your ratio? Yeah. So now it's gone from a two-story building to a three-story mm-hmm. building. So the land title says it's a two-story building, but now it's got a third story. Even though you haven't added extra just by removing that, now that ceiling is too high, right? So it's considered a third story. And the balcony, the, the deck, um, how they calculate, I think we've discussed before, is... What, what gets classified as building, like in the building footprint, is a roof covered area. Right. So the fact that you have a deck, even if it's uncovered, it doesn't add to the space. But the area below it, 
the old the old open car park that used to be below it is now has a now has a roof on top of it that you can use to, to store stuff under and it, it rain cannot go through that's now a roof for the space below oh. so it goes over in terms of footprint so the building footprint is now much too large and also the area as well is counted so that first floor that used to be 50 square meters is now 65 square meters even though it's still a car a car park area it's now covered Mm. Um, the the only yeah. way to get around that for at least, well i don't know about the car park but the but i know people um who actually got a builder in and put a put a wall on like taking the staircase like mm. hidden the staircase behind a wall and had the yeah. bank inspection got the bank finance and then re-renovated it after <laughs> after they after they moved in um, oh yeah yeah so that's that's part of the discussion now is okay well, let's let's fill it up um, yeah. Let's, yeah, like, put some drywall over the top, right? yeah. Okay, drywall and see what you can do about you removing the, adjusting the balcony. But the problem is the balcony, it's a big, like, steel, steel yeah, frame that's, a, that's in the concrete. A, it's not the balcony yeah. steel breaker, yeah. Yeah, so, so even if we just remove the floorboards from it, reduce the width of it and make it just, like, 30 centimeter deep balcony and remove the, the, the deck flooring, so now you go in the car park and although there's the, the driveway although there's a metal balcony frame around you it's open. You, 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 there, there's no ceiling above it yeah. right there's no there's no roof um the bank once they see it and they've seen the floor plans like they'll go and go well we know what you're gonna do <laughs> <laughs> like we, we we know like this is this is going to be extended How I mean, like, stupid you're gonna do you think <laughs> yeah it seems like, so so that's kind of the the challenge so we talk about how difficult it is to get financing for for even an akia even a house, and this house is like 16 years old, um, just because of these two minor sort of changes, which it, it's nothing actually structural. That roof, they haven't made the roof higher, like the actual right. exterior roof. All they've moved is the ceiling, like the, the fake ceiling, and made it like, you know, going up with the, the actual height of the roof, um, the, the natural roof. That disqualifies it. Now, yeah, yeah. Th that, that disqualifies it. And now that they've got like just a steel deck out front, like a carport implement. That's that's disqualified it. Um, so it may yeah, financing is very difficult. So it has to be priced a lot cheaper, um, and is likely going to be a cash a cash buy. And we're talking probably like in the fifty mid fifty million yen range um, in in Tokyo. So yeah, just about that. So that, that's called like the how we refer to that when we're um, in uh, typically is a kem, so kempe bitsu is the name for the footprint building footprint as a percentage of the land size. And your sekiritsu is the total land, um, a total floor space of the property, right? And like first floor, second floor, and third floor combined as a portion to the, to the, uh, to the land size. So it'd be like this, this particular area is 40% and 80%, 40% footprint, 80% um, uh, property size ratio. In more dense areas, like, like where I live in Setagaya, it's 60% and 150%. Is the footprint but, so? But if they, if they had cash, if they had cash, they could just buy it, right? There would be no, there would be no impediment to purchase. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, so it's purely with with the financing. The finance, if they're going to buy right. cash. What makes buying a property in Tokyo, your own family home, such a good, like so attractive, is that the money is free. Essentially, it's, the bank will give you hundred percent or one hundred and five percent financing, and the interest is like zero point five percent, zero point seven percent. Okay, the one guy we got, um, uh, I think at the start of this year, was 0.475%. Um, and recently, one of our, our staff got, like one of our sales staff, got for a Japanese guy, 0.425% for a 100% loan. And that's, that's the interest rate. Um, so it, it's free money. So why would you put a half a million dollars of your own cash when you can get, you know, 3 to 7% just, you know, or, or more just in even you know bonds or stock market etc or any kind of other asset class is oh, going to give you Emil, more, Emil, than, more than sorry that. sorry sorry emil one question i totally forgot to ask you um I, mm. I, actually after that i might have to uh, um i might have to log I'm off but you guys can carry on yeah, I gotta go. um with mortgages so you know how you mentioned time and time again that you guys also act as mortgage brokers right yes and um you obviously serve foreign customers so for you it's it's kind of a routine thing when we have customers who are looking to purchase in other cities that are not that familiar with foreigners, 
there's still the same infrastructure in place in the sense that the listing agent, especially if it's a bigger agency, usually have bank connections and can help organize the mortgage. Yes. But mm-hmm. how, how easy is it for them in, say, uh, Kumamoto to approach their bank and say they've got a foreign buyer, which they probably haven't done much before? Um, well, so when you say approach their bank, it will be, you know, generally uh, the big ones are uh, MUFG, Mizuho and uh, SMBC. Yeah. They're the mega banks. Rizona is also one of the big ones now. Okay, so and Rizona Bank. So they're the, the, big, the big four banks. Um, and then there's the local banks. So usually the, they'll go with just, they'll approach just one of the big ones. Okay. Miz- so that's uh, what like most local. agents do, is it? They go most with agents, the big even, yeah, even, even in, in other prefectures, right? They'll, they'll have the loan officers assert, like, assigned to their agency, like what we do. So our, our agency here in Tokyo, in Ibis, um, we have loan officers assigned from the mortgage center. They are assigned to our agency, to our account. So, you know, if you want, like if I have a client, I think, okay, SMBC will give them the best deal. I will engage with, I will just call um, like email or fax uh, some documentation to our bank, to our loan, uh, the the loan center in Shibuya, where our loan officer is um, assigned. And then I'll give him a call. I was like, okay, Tanaka-san, I just emailed you some documentation. This is a client, this is a situation. Usually, like I'll say that, like if they're just a salaried employee, the typical salary man, then I don't even need to do that. I have a good idea of how much the bank will loan him or her. Well, generally, it's like someone, oh, maybe they've just changed jobs. I say, this is what they were doing. And now they've just changed jobs two months ago. Here are the last two pay slips. What should we do? Like, how long do we need to wait until they've been employed at their current job? Until they do it, etc. So usually, if it's really squeaky clean, um, like, you know, they've been salaried employee at the same company for uh you know for three years four years and they have permanent residency then it's quite straightforward once they are no longer that they have any other kind of issue they're self-employed a business owner um or uh they don't have permanent residency we need to start it it gets to be a bit more difficult but in general if they're permanent residents out in the middle of nowhere the middle of nowhere but outside of tokyo sorry let me (laughs) rephrase that um then yeah their, their, their agent should be able to engage with the banks. Otherwise, Assuming if it's one of the big ones, if it's a small local uh, bank, well, even if, even, a, even a small, uh, even if a small local local agency will be able, will know which banks to deal with. Okay, um, and if they have no one, sometimes the local agents, um, it's a mom and pop shop. They may not have anyone they deal with, and they just have the exclusive right of the listing. They, um, you know, if you really want that property, then yeah, you can just walk into any branch shop on your own. And say you want to buy it, um, but you need to have permanent residency. Yeah. yeah. If yeah, if um, and then if you and if not, then you can ask the agent. Look, which bank will finance this? And they may say the local Shinyo Ginko, the local trust bank or local credit union, um, in, in that area, will be able to do it. And in that case, then you go speak to that branch as an individual. Right. So then the buyer needs to walk in and try to get the loan, but. Then again, if we're running into local smaller banks that might not be used to dealing with foreigners on a regular basis. Oh, but but, the, but the dealing with foreigners is do you have permanent residency or not? That's the idea of dealing with foreigners. Okay. okay. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's the hurdle. You have a and stable salary local, and are you a resident? That's pretty much it. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, if you have permanent residency, one. then. Yeah, yeah. All right. See you next time. Take it easy. All right. Um, yeah, I think... Uh, Awesome. So that, that answers uh, all of my uh, questions. Um, I'm, I'm good to call it a day. Thank you. Folks. I'm good to call it a day too. Yeah, I've got a question for Emil in a bit, so we'll just hang on. Awesome. All right. Thanks, folks. Uh, thank you. Bye, Zip. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Recording. Stop. So there you have it. Nice long conversation there, information packed as usual, and I hope a touch of reality for many of you out there who, like our listener who sent in the questions, may have some ideas that are very applicable in many other countries, but not always here in Japan. Things can be a bit different here, and it's important to be aware of these differences before pulling the trigger on any expenses. Hope you found value in the conversation. Now, before we go, we're also, as always, going to tell you and also link to our other sponsor's website. That's Hiroshi Shimizu, immigration lawyer and administrative scrivener. If you're thinking about moving here on a more permanent basis, or you're already in Japan on some sort of a temporary visa, 
and you want to switch to a longer term or permanent one, or if you're considering setting up a local company or a branch office of a foreign company and you've got any sort of business or visa related inquiries, or even if you just want to find out what your options are on any of these topics, feel free to contact Hiroshi Shimizu. You can find him at japanimmigrationexperts.com and he can help you set up a company, apply for any kind of visa, or just provide you with the best advice and extremely affordable consultation related to these topics. And he's already done that for many of our listeners. So feel free to reach out to him. Again, that's japanimmigrationexperts.com and you'll be well on your way. And that's it from us for today, folks. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Japan Real Estate Podcast. Do share it with your networks and please let us know what you think. So leave us a short rating or review on the iTunes store, on Spotify, or just drop us a line in the comment section or wherever you might have found this episode. We love hearing from you. Hope to have you with us again next time. And until then, have a great day or night ahead. Yoroshiku.